Well, the destructiveness of extreme weather is one of the biggest stories of our time. Fire, drought, and floods. We spend a lot of time showing you the effects of climate change. Good evening. I'm Jim Barry. And I'm Lauren Pastrana. Naja is off. It's also important to talk about the causes. And starting tonight, that's what we'll do on a regular basis. What you're about to see will look a little different and take more time than usual. Because we're making a commitment in our newscast to understand climate change, kicking off this journey of discovery is our guide, David Schechter. Earth, it is so vast and so beautiful. It can be hard to grasp that we could possibly ever alter it. Maybe that's because the largest force that's changing our climate is invisible. My name is David Schechter, and I'm your guide on a journey to explore how we're changing the Earth and how the Earth is changing us. This is On The Dot. We're going to the Mauna Loa Observatory, and this is where the carbon dioxide readings come from. And I, I'm like, I gotta go see that place. When it comes to office views, thanks for having us out, man. Yeah, of course. Aiden Colton is crushing it. We visited him before a recent volcanic eruption temporarily interrupted operations up here. It's not the easiest place to get to, as you can see. No, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> it's not the easiest <laughs> place to work. Um, it's 11,000 foot elevation. You know, every time you take a breath of air, you're breathing in a third less oxygen. Too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is what drives climate change. And for the last 65 years, scientists around the world have relied on the carbon dioxide dioxide measurements taken on Mauna Loa. Aiden is the guy who takes them and he invited us to come along. This is the carbon cycle um, NOAA portable sampling unit. Um, and what we're doing here... Kind of looks like the nuclear launch codes might also be in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> luckily they're not. Aiden's telling me the air up here is what makes this remote location so important. We're more than 11,000 feet up, far above any ground level pollution from communities below. And we're surrounded by 2,000 miles of ocean. So by the time air makes its way here, it's been blended with air from across the globe. All right, so we'll just hold our breath, just because that's what I usually do when we get like 10 seconds. But once I close it off, we're... We have to, we, we have to hold our breath? It, it's very hard to affect it, but no, we don't want to contaminate. Tell me when I have to hold All my right, breath. So. I looked over at you and I'm like, I don't think you're going to be able to do this. Chance. Hold your breath. I couldn't hold it. I had to breathe. These samples gathered once a week will be sent to a lab for analysis. There's also a tower another 140 feet up that pulls and analyzes samples 24 hours a day, determining how much carbon dioxide is in the air at such a high altitude. You have all this research from this location. What story does it tell? Well, our job is to, is to present the facts. And the fact is that carbon dioxide is increasing and it has been increasing since we started monitoring it. Starting in 1958, this graph of samples taken in Hawaii shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rising year after year after year. Now let's go back in time by 800,000 years. By studying things like ice core samples, ocean sediment, and tree rings, scientists have a good idea how much carbon has historically been in the Earth's atmosphere. It goes up and down over time, but it's never crossed this line. And now, let's bring things back to what's happened in the last 65 years. The CO2 in the atmosphere has never been seen this high in, in human history. It's harder and harder for me to speak to uh, people like yourself and be optimistic. I want to see some change and I want to see it start to plateau. So we've got a lot of carbon dioxide. Now let's talk about where it's coming from. So I think this next stop would be pretty cool. This company has figured out how to visualize carbon dioxide. Hello! Davida Herzl is the CEO of Aclima. In Oakland, her company operates a fleet of cars outfitted with tubes and sensors that analyze the air for 14 kinds of pollution. One of them is carbon dioxide, which floats straight up into the atmosphere and can stay there for hundreds of years. To deal with climate change, to deal with air pollution, you really have to understand where it's coming from and you have to take local measurements to do that. As we're driving, how many measurements are happening right now? 
right now, um, every single uh, second, we're taking a measurement. Off this hose. Off of that, yeah, the air is getting sampled. We're moving through the streets. That enables us to pinpoint the precise location of those measurements. There are a lot of ways that carbon dioxide gets into the air, but according to the EPA, the number one source of carbon emissions is transportation at 27%. I mean, you can look out the window. There is, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I mean, 10 trucks just, yeah. just in front of us right yeah. now. Diesel trucks. Uh, diesel trucks. And what you're looking at here, that's the CO2 coming off of these trucks. What she's showing me is a visualization of carbon dioxide on the streets of Oakland. The lower concentrations are purple on the side streets. The much higher yellow levels are freeways. And those things that look like skyscrapers are emissions where two highways come together. Businesses and governments use a climate's data to identify and reduce sources of pollution. This isn't just an invisible problem. You can now see it. It's visible. It's measurable. And when I drive, and when you I drive, contribute. you're contributing. You're putting CO2 into the air. So the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has exploded, and transportation is a major contributor. But why is carbon dioxide a problem? We're, we're trying to get an idea of how this greenhouse effect works. How does CO2 have this power over controlling the Earth's temperature? Dr. Eugene Cordero is a climatologist at San Jose State. We're meeting up at a science museum in Oakland, and he's gonna help us understand the greenhouse effect, where carbon dioxide functions like a blanket around the Earth. He's telling me as the Earth naturally radiates heat, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere retains some of that heat, and that's what makes the planet comfortable. His demonstration here involves a candle, a camera, and a piece of glass. So you were kind enough to bring a candle. I also uh, stopped and got a few candles. Oh, cool. Fresh lavender breeze. Oh, that's nice. That one smells pretty good. Yeah, so we're gonna have a heat source. This like represents the Earth. So the Earth gets warmed uh, during the day by the sun, and then it gives off energy. So we have- This is the heat of the source. Earth? Yeah, right there. Okay. So we have our planet right there. Okay. And then we have this camera, this special camera that, that senses infrared radiation or heat. And that's like a satellite orbiting the planet. To be honest, that's the best way to measure this greenhouse effect. From is, space. From space. Like, is this our carbon dioxide? Yeah, it behaves in the same way because it absorbs this particular type of radiation. So I'm gonna basically put the carbon dioxide. You're gonna put this blanket of carbon dioxide. In between the Earth and the satellite, and the satellite. In space. Yep. It just disappears. Take a closer look at the candle. The wavelengths of heat show up as white, red, and yellow. When the glass comes into frame, it shows up as solidly purple, so you can't even see the candle behind it. Dr. Cordero is saying when you add more carbon dioxide to the blanket around the Earth, our planet retains more heat. Our natural light from the sun passes through, but then the infrared radiation on its way out- Can't get out. Can't get out. But now we have a lot more CO2 than we used to, and so our planet's temperature is gonna go up. It's a great, it's a great thermostat. Now let's take another look at that graph from Hawaii. This is the line that shows carbon in the atmosphere going up and up. Now add in global average temperatures. As the carbon dioxide rises, the temperature rises too. Dr. Cordero says a large body of research shows us that is what's driving extreme events like fires, floods, and drought. How long have we known that carbon dioxide can do something like this? Yeah, over 100 years. Over That's 100 that, years. Yeah, so we that the CO2 um, and other greenhouse gases is the largest contribution to changing our, what our planet's like right now and, and making it warmer. There's, there's other factors too, but carbon dioxide is, is the number one. How worried should I be about that piece of glass? I think this is our main social environmental challenge for humanity. When it comes to climate change, carbon dioxide is an invisible problem. But we've seen, with a little imagination, it's not impossible to understand what it's doing up there, where it comes from, and how we have more and more in the atmosphere every year. Together, we're gonna to explore how changing the climate changes our world and what we can do about it. I'm David Schechter, on The Dot. And you wanna to talk to David about tonight's story? Just send a tweet to at David Schechter or use the hashtag 
on the dot. They call it an invisible problem, but really helped us visualize it. Absolutely, you understand it, and that is a key, I think. Mm -hmm.